Hello, everybody. Today we're going to talk about interrupts. Pardon me for interrupting. Interrupts. Very useful. What is an interrupt? Well, you know, what's an interrupt, right? Somebody barges in. An interrupt is essentially a high priority piece of code that is going to sort of take over, do its thing, perhaps in the middle of, you know, your sort of main line of code, all right? If you think about on the Arduino, you have this function called loop, right? And what it really is, as far as, as its uh, uh, setup, It looks something like this. A loop is just this call inside a while loop that goes forever. You write your code inside loop, and it just runs, runs, runs. When it gets to the bottom of loop, it just comes right back in because it's just inside this while loop. So what you're really doing is something like this. While you know, while true, right? And then you just have a bunch of, you know, code lines doing whatever. And you're done. So, you know, what are these, you know, whatever? Well, you could be, you know, checking an input pin, right? Get a value from that. You could be writing a value to a port. You could be calculating something. You could be... Um, you know, taking a read from an analog input, um, you know, mapping something. There's a whole bunch of things you can do, right? Etc. Well, in the middle of this, an interrupt can run, right? So this just goes forever. You know, it starts in, gets to the bottom, comes back up, and just forever, 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 forever. So an interrupt is this little piece of code that can sort of barge in in the middle of any of this and do its thing. Now, you might wonder, you know, why do I even need to do this? Well, it's totally a matter of priority, and I'll explain this in a sec. But here's a really important thing you have to understand. When the interrupt sort of barges in, when it interrupts, just like if you were, um, you know, at a party talking to some friends, someone can interrupt right in the middle of a sentence, right? You could be in, in the middle of a word and this person could just, boom, start talking. So you could have uh, uh, a piece of code in here like, um, you know, A gets B plus C. And right in the middle of this, you know, literally like um, pulling the value from memory and putting it into the value of, uh, into the variable C, right? Like right before you do the addition, you know, boom, this thing can come in. So you're right in the middle of something, okay? It's not like it's going to wait for this, this statement to finish, okay? You know, the microprocessor is out there fetching a value from location C, and it's going to put it into a register so it can add it. You know, boom, right there, right in the middle. Here comes the, here comes the interrupt, okay? So we just have to remember this is like a really high priority. Think like um, panic switch. You know, something really nasty has happened. Something we have to deal with immediately. Right? High priority code. So what can we say about this? Well, first of all, we would probably like to keep this short. You know, I'm going to barge in and sort of do something. I'm going to take over. So I don't want to take over everything for too long. Okay? So we do want to keep it short. It's possible to have multiple levels of uh, your uh, interrupt, right? So these can be prioritized. Okay, so you have several potential levels. So one interrupt can interrupt another interrupt. Yeah, because it's like super, super important. Right, you know, on a, something like a uh, uh, 
desktop computer, you might have an interrupt-driven keyboard. Right? You're typing, and you want to grab that uh, that letter that you just hit, that numeral that, that you just hit. It's a it's a high priority thing, or you know you're moving the mouse, so it's just going to sort of kind of barrel in and say, "Hey, I just hit the letters T or you know whatever it is." Okay, all right. Um, so what kind of things actually generate the the interrupt? Right? What is it that causes the interrupt? Well, they can be generated by external events. You know, like I said, you could hit a hit a key on a keyboard, right? Now, in our case, um, on a microcontroller, you know, like an Uno, what this usually means is you're talking about the level on a pin. So, in other words, this thing has. Um, for example, changed from a low to a high. There's a rising edge or a falling edge. That's what's happening. That's what's going to trigger it. If you think in terms of, again, like a panic button, you could press the button and drive a pin. Let's say that was floating high. You could drive that low. And that low triggers the uh, interrupt. Okay. They could also be generated by internal events. Well, what do you mean by an internal event? Well, literally inside the microcontroller. So what we're talking about here would be things like um, a timer counter overflowing. All right, so if you have like an 8-bit counter that you know goes from uh, 0 to 255, when it hits 255, the next value wouldn't be 256, right? Because you only have eight bits, it would roll back to zero. That's an overflow. So you could have that trigger an interrupt, right? Um, you could do a timer counter uh, compare match. So these have compare registers, right? And, you know, more information on this, we have obviously data on timer counters separate. We could do um, something like an analog to digital a converter, right? We could do a, a conversion complete. That could trigger. Now, if we have serial communications, that could trigger an, uh, an event, an internal event. So there's many things that could actually start off this, this process. Okay? So to use them, what's the, what's the uh, order of, of uh, you know, work we have to do? Well, uh, the first thing we would have to do, item number one, is we must enable the interrupts, right? So these things aren't on automatically. You will find that there are typically um, registers for things like, uh, like a, a bit that would be a global interrupt enable. And then there would be separate registers for things like enabling specific kinds of external events or specific kinds of internal events. So that might require, you know, a couple of statements. In other words, for example, one to enable globally, number two to enable a, uh, uh, a timer counter overflow for timer number 2A or something like that. Okay. Um, so, you know, we could put that down as a separate thing, say enable specific, and we could say this is you know, generally, globally, and then we would have to enable the specific one, right? Now, because there could be many of them, right, you're going to have to get in here and be very specific. So, um, that's going to be a, a, a bit set for each one. You might have three interrupts. That's going to be three of these, right? If you have an external interrupt, you're going to have to set up the hardware, right? How do I want to do that? What is it that's going to trigger it? And if, 
if that's what you're using. I mean, it might be something as simple as just a passive switch, right, where you, you have um, an output pin floating high, and then you just have a switch that shorts it to ground. Right? That could be it. That simple. Could be coming in from maybe some logic circuit somewhere that's going to throw a, a pin high instead of throwing it low. Right? Obviously, your code is going to have to match whatever the hardware is. Okay. Step four, if you're using internal um, interrupts, you're going to have to set up the, the code and the registers for that. So there might be quite a bit of bit fiddling. And as I said, if you're going to use these like timer counters, there's a bunch of different timer counters. There's different ways of, of utilizing them. So you might have to do quite a little bit of bit fiddling on here, right? Just setting up the timer counters is a whole nother piece of work, right? So when I say set up code registers, if you're going to do that, the timer counter, how do you want to do this, right? You can do a compare match thing. Are you going to do an overflow thing? Um, what is it? There's several different modes you can set the timer counters in. So all of that has to be set up. Once that's done, right? So this is all like one shot kind of thing, you know? initialization code. Um, then we need to write the interrupt service routine. Interrupt service routine, also known as an ISR. It is the function, it is the code that's called. Oops, that's supposed to be an S. Okay, an ISR. Um, this is really nothing more than a function. And when the interrupt is generated, right, let's say it's like an external, you hit a switch, this little bit of code, this function gets called. Right? Everything else is sort of put in suspended animation, and this thing gets called. So you have to write that code, and you have to set its address in some kind of vector table. Now, in the UNO world, some of this is sort of done for you, okay? Sort of half done for you. In the uh, Arduino, they have a set of already named vectors. Right? These are function names. They hit, already give them names. All you have to do is sort of match the name, and it understands, okay, I'm gonna, instead of using my sort of null stub, I'm going to use this thing that this guy calls All right so you know they might give it a name like pc int zero vect you know a name like that so that's what you have to call your function so you would have this thing you know whatever it's called i'll just i'll just call it my my funk All right and you do whatever it is in here so your code over here is running, 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 running. You know, right in the middle of something, like I said, maybe right in the middle of this, the interrupt is generated. Right? Whether it's a clock or an external thing, interrupt is generated. So what happens is wherever you are in this code, that's all saved. Okay? The uh, microcontroller saves the current status of everything. Then it vectors off. All right, this is where the term vector comes from. It vectors off to this, so it's like out here, and then it just sort of like jumps to here, does this, then it jumps back from where it left off and resets everything. All right, so all that stuff was saved, a context is saved, jumps off, does this, jumps back, the stuff that was saved is reset, everything's back the way it was. All right. This is why you want to keep it short, because you don't want to leave this stuff hanging for too long. So very typically, this little function might just do something like uh, maybe adjust a global variable, and that's about it. Okay, it's not doing a whole lot. Um, you know, you're not going to have like long delay code and stuff like that in here. It's get in, get out, do it, boom. All right. Now, there are a couple little tricks you have to be aware of. 
because an interrupt can happen at any instant, you probably want to have global copies of things. So if you have some global variable out here, all right, because this is how you're going to sort of read back and forth. If you just had a, um, a local variable, like I just got an int over here, yeah, int x. Remember, this is auto class, meaning it's created when the function is entered, it's destroyed when it leaves. So how do you pass something back? Because it's not like a normal function call, you know, where you can say, you know, z gets my funk or something like that, right? That's not, not the way it works. So the way you sort of pass information back and forth is through some kind of global variable. So you would have instead something like this. You'd say int, you know, I'll just call it global x. So in here, you would be accessing global x. Like maybe you have something like a counter kind of thing. And um, every time you press a button, this gets incremented. So in this case, this global x, you would just maybe increment it, you know, like plus plus, this kind of thing. All right, that's all it does, it just increments that value. And then back here, maybe you're going to display it. So you are going to, um, instead of directly dealing with global x, you would make a local copy of it before you deal with it. So your local copy, you know, might be something like, I'll just call it my copy. And then you would say, my copy gets global x. Because you don't, you don't want to um, uh, sort of monkey with global x directly. You want to kind of hide that. And now you can manipulate my copy. Right? So maybe you need to do something where you're you know, multiplying it or doing an integer divide or you know, whatever the heck it is. Okay? Because here's the deal. Like I said, the interrupt can happen at any point. So if you were directly dealing with global copy, right in the middle of your computation, another interrupt could come by and change it. Whoa, that can have all kinds of nasty side effects, right? So you just work on your copy of it. It's kind of like that instant in time. And then the next time when this thing loops through and my global my, my global x over here has been changed. Well, the next time through, it'll use the changed value, right? The other thing that you want to do is to avoid too aggressive of an optimization. Anything that, that could be manipulated by uh, any variable that could be manipulated by, by a, uh, an interrupt function over here, those variables you would typically... Um, use the modifier volatile on it. So you wouldn't just say it's an int, right? You wouldn't say it's int x. You'd say it's a volatile integer x. And what this will do is the compiler will not try to overly optimize this. You know, in a real simplistic case, if you had something like, let's say you had like this, right? For c is zero. C is less than 100, C++, right? Um, and then you just, um, you know, maybe you had some other stuff in here, wasn't too important, and you just assign some other variable like D the value of C. Let's say, let's say this was empty, okay? You know, a smart compiler would look at this and just say, oh, well, this thing just counts from 0 up to, you know, 100. So why even do this? Why not just set D to 100? Right? Because you're not doing anything else. Um, you know, maybe you're doing this because this is going to take a certain amount of time to do. You're just wasting time. And maybe get something to sync up. It's not a great way to do that, but it's one possible way. Um, in which case, that's going to be thwarted by the compiler. If you had declared C as volatile, because maybe C is going to be uh, you know, manipulated in here, possibly by, you know, an interrupt, um, the compiler will say, no, I'm, I'm not going to try and, and, and uh, optimize this. I'm just going to do whatever you wrote. Okay. So th this can kind of get you out of trouble in those sorts of cases. All right. Okay. So keep it small. 
values are usually going to be traded around using uh, globals. And to access a global, you know, I showed this, but to access a global, usually we try to, like I said, hide this. So, you know, typically what we would do is we would call a function. We would make a function like, um, again, this is kind of a stupid name, global x, but I'm just going to call a function called get global x. It's just going to return an int. And all this does is it just returns global x. So it hides it. My, my copy thing wouldn't just directly access global x. It would call get global x. Right? So, gee, that seems kind of you know, convoluted. Well, the idea is to sort of protect and hide that variable. Um, and as a matter of fact, this is done right in the ADC system. There's a good example of this, which is uh, uh, sort of manipulating the uh, reference standard for the analog to digital converter. Right? There is a function in there to set what the reference is. So this goes both ways. You could either read or write. Um, so to prevent people from, from sort of accidentally uh, overwriting this supposedly hidden global variable, we just sort of encase it in a function like this. Okay, so that, This is maybe a little bit more of a fine point, but um, it's a useful thing to remember. Right? Here's the big stuff. Keep it short. These things can be prioritized to several levels, so interrupts can, can interrupt other interrupts. Interrupts can be generated by external events, right? basically a level on a pin. They can be generated by internal events. Typically, that would be a timer counter, either overflowing, going into a compare match, or some other uh, specific level. Um, analog digital conversion completes another possibility. Uh, serial um, uh, transfer is another possibility. There's a bunch of these. Matter of fact, if you look in the, uh, the appendix of the text, there is a list. There's 20 some odd, maybe 30 uh, entries in the vector table for the Arduino system. So there's that many different ones that you can use. Okay. All right. Uh, next time around, we'll, we'll look at uh, an example of exactly how to use this.